Welcome to the final video lecture on classification and regression trees. Um, now we want to take the things that we've already learned about classification and regression trees and kind of talk about what their advantages and disadvantages are. Okay, so um, advantages certainly are that these kinds of trees, if they're not too complex, they are fairly easy to understand, interpret, and visualize. So this is a method that you can, I mean, you, you know, you can show the tree structure. It's something that everybody can understand after a little bit of explanation. So it's also easy to communicate um, the way that the model works to people who are maybe not data analysts or statisticians themselves. Uh, so in that sense, it's easy to understand, to interpret, to visualize. Um, this is a this is a huge um, advantage. Um, it's also a huge advantage that this is very robust to say low level data quality in the sense that there is really not much pre-processing that you have to do. Features that are not numeric are no problem. You can just treat them as is. You don't even have to worry about uh, setting up like a dummy coding for category variables like you would have to do for linear regression or stuff like that. Yeah, all of that just gets taken care of. Um, a huge win for classification and regression trees is that they can deal with missing values in the features. Yeah? We've talked about this in a previous video. Trees, while they're being built, um, also build up um, basically a, f a set of fallback rules with which to split the data if the data that they really want to use is not available, the so-called surrogate splits. Yeah, and this is, this is great. This makes it really useful for applications. Um, cards are also absolutely robust against outliers in the features because we're basically just looking at step functions and where to split the data. It, really doesn't matter whether we have some feature values that are just way off and completely you know far far away from all the rest of the data doesn't matter yeah it doesn't affect the fit at all um and also this robustness to monotone transformations is nice so we don't have to worry about the different scalings of the features for example yeah it doesn't matter in what units we um provide these features or something um, another very important advantage of trees that we haven't talked about yet at all, but that is hugely important for applications, is that trees are a very easy and cheap way to build interaction effects between features. Right? Because if you think about a tree branch that for the first split along the branch uses one feature, then for the next um, split along that branch uses a different feature and so on and so forth yeah what you end up with is you end up with an interaction effect a rule that says that doesn't just look at one of the features but that says okay well if feature one is above this value and feature two is below that value and feature three is below that value then I predict something like that so that's an interaction between three features right there yeah so it's very easy, and trees are very good, at building higher order interaction effects. Um, okay, final feature, we could call it a feature, we could also call it a bug, um, is that remember that the hypothesis space of these uh, cards are step functions over the feature space, or to be more concrete, rectangular step functions over the feature space. So that means, with cards, it's very easy to model discontinuities, so abrupt jumps, because that's what a step function is, an abrupt jump, and nonlinearities. Yeah, that's easy to do with a classification and regression tree. Mm, but that's not the whole story. Yeah, uh, We'll talk about that more um, when we talk about disadvantages. Um, another very important aspect of trees um, which makes them very, very good learners, is they do automatic feature selection. So think about a data set where you have 100 features, 
but only five of them actually matter. Yeah. What the tree will do is it will do the split optimization thing and figure out that actually only these first five features are relevant for building a tree. The other 95 features are just getting ignored. Yeah, so because in every, every time the tree does a split, it will only use the optimal one, it will tend to basically completely ignore any noise variables, any noise features that don't really have any information about the distribution of our target variable. Yeah. Um, okay, it's also actually a quite a fast method, so it does scale well with the uh, largest data because the computations that you have to do, they're all fairly simple. You split the data, um, just basically compute means or relative frequencies on both, both sides of the threshold. There's a number of ways that you can even speed up that computation a little bit. So this is also scales well for largest data. Yeah, so that's, that's nice too. It's quite fast. Um, and finally, it is a very flexible method because you can define custom split criteria that basically any loss function you want, you can use as your split criterion. Um, and also any rule you want for generating a prediction in a leaf, you can just use whatever you want there almost. So that means that trees have been extended to many, many different aspects. Yeah, there's trees that are used for clustering data, so unsupervised problems. There is semi-supervised trees where only for a part of the data you ha actually have the um, target values available. There's trees that do density estimation. So their prediction is not just a point value, it's an entire density of your feature value um, for data that ends up in that leaf and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's a huge number of uh, very interesting extensions um, of these tree models um, to other settings than the simple regression and classification settings that we talked about here. Okay, so trees are great. Yeah, that's a, that's a takeaway. They have very, very many, very nice properties. Now, let's talk about some disadvantages. Um, because trees split up the feature space into rectangular regions where the rectangles are parallel to the axis, yeah, um, trees have a hard time modeling things that are, for example, linear in the <clears throat> that are linear in the in the features. Yeah. So um, if you look at this synthetic example here, um, basically you could make a very very simple decision rule here and say, well, everything that's above the line is a circle, and everything that's below the line is a triangle. Yeah. But in order to get such a diagonal line with a step function, that requires a lot of steps. Yeah, so you see here, I mean, already this is a fairly complicated tree with, um, I don't know, yeah, probably nine or 10 nodes so to, get this kind of, uh, to get this kind of stair going here. Uh, but it still doesn't approximate the true decision region very well or the true decision boundary very well. Yeah, so we would need a lot, a tree with a lot, a lot of nodes to get a step function that is fairly close to that diagonal line here. Okay, with logistic regression, we could just model this very, very easily. Um, another thing is that, well, we are getting a step function yeah, so if the true underlying thing is something that is smooth, well, you will need a lot of steps. So you will need a very complicated tree to approximate something that's smooth well with a step function. Yeah, so here, for example, in red would be the true function and black, that would be our tree model. And you can see, well, most of the time it doesn't approximate the function very well. Yeah, you need a lot more steps in your step function to really capture the shape of that function. Um, another disadvantage is empirically, it just turns out that trees 
by themselves in this simple fashion that we've uh, introduced them here are actually not that great at predictions. So there are many other methods that tend to perform better. But these other methods, they're often actually based on trees. So if we combine this idea of building a tree with the idea of bagging, that will give us random forest. That will be um, the topic of the next chapter. Um, and similar with boosting, um, yeah, if we do boosting for trees, that also makes them a lot better. Another disadvantage of trees is their instability. Um, if you change the training data just a little tiny bit, that may mean that the tree that you get back looks completely different to the one that you got originally. Why is that? Well, because in every step we do a greedy optimization. So if the data happens to change something early on in the tree, yeah, everything that comes after that is, will be completely different. Hmm? Um, that also means that even though in principle trees are easy to interpret, they're not actually interpretable because, well, their, their actual shape is fairly random. Yeah, it really depends on very small changes in the data and you could end up with a tree model that maybe gives you similar predictions, but still looks completely different internally. Yeah, so maybe they're not as interpretable as we thought they were. Um, okay. Right. And final thing for trees, well, you know, if we have, if we are defining um, a regression function that is a piecewise constant and we are looking at new unseen data that's outside the range of what we have already observed, we're just extrapolating a constant. And in many cases, that probably won't be um, a, a sensible thing to do. All right. So these were some um, disadvantages of trees. There are many different implementations of trees. As you can see, the earliest ones is from the 60s, um, but there's still um, actually current research going on. Um, all right, that's it for the tree chapter. Thank you for listening.